Well, welcome. Welcome to our, our new webinar, uh, Conformal Coding Defects, How to Diagnose, Repair, and Prevent. Okay. And uh, I'm your moderator, Kevin Polowski. I'm a marketing communications manager over at ITW Contamination Control. Long name, but with the, the, by the brands you know, you're generally going to know us by Chemtronics or Tech Spray. And, and today we're going to mostly be talking about Tech Spray. Also with us, We've got Enrique Francis. He is the field uh, engineer uh, with Chemtronics and Tech Spray. So if you guys are using uh, our products or you're qualifying our products, he's your new best friend. Uh, he's going to be working with you directly either in the lab, uh, running your samples, or he's going to fly out and meet you in the field, meet you at your facility and get you up and running. So right here, uh, you've got uh, his contact information. Now, also with us, John Urquhart. Uh, he's the director of global applications engineer at PVA. Now, PVA is a top name in the actual equipment to apply the conformal coating. So with you today, we've got two experts, one on the chemical side and the other on the equipment side. And so the name of the game is we're going to uh, give you everything we can in terms of identifying uh, and preventing defects, either from the chemical side or from the um or from the equipment side. Okay, so today what we're going to cover is uh, an overview of conformal coating in general. Now, very quickly on that part of it. Now, we're generally going to assume that you guys are already working with conformal coating. Now, because we're going to be digging into a lot of the logistics of applying coating, uh, not as much about what coating is, the type of coating you want to select. If you are uh, in that in that uh, category. We're happy you're here. Uh, reach out to us, and I'd be happy to give you a personal tour of conformal coding. Uh, I'm sure John and, and Enrique would as well. So please don't be a stranger, and please uh, you know continue to, to stay with us, but know that we're going to get pretty deep into the weeds on this in terms of actually applying the coding. Uh, so we're, we're going to cover the most common types of defects, common causes, and then most importantly, how to prevent them in the first place, because it gets really expensive to shut your line down and fix these things. And so, and especially if you get defective parts that get out in the field. And so the name of the game is first and foremost, let's prevent these problems. And of course, we'll leave time at, at the end for questions, but we may be answering questions as we go as well. Just to give you uh, an idea of what a conformal coding is, uh, you can think of it as a shellac for a circuit board, okay? Like any uh, shellac you would apply to like wood furniture, uh, it's to protect from the environment. Now it's, I don't wanna say it's exactly like a shellac because there are companies out there buying from Home Depot and using the conform for conformal coating. We don't recommend that, okay? These are specialized chemicals tested for circuit boards, okay? We work hard to make sure they're good for those applications. There's qualification testing we go through, whether it's IPC 830, uh, CC 830B, or whether it's a uh, mil spec, whether it's a uh, UL, to prove it's good for its purpose. So it is specialized for that. Now, the reason we call it conformal coating, because it conforms to the contours of the board, it's lightweight, flexible. Its job is to increase the reliability of the circuit board. Okay, and it's doing that by prevent, uh, preventing uh, contamination and problems from the outside environment and also problems from the board itself, whether it be uh, uh, cycling, uh, thermal cycling, whether that be uh, arcing, you know, things of that nature. Okay, it could be helping with humidity, temperature resistant, could be preventing current leakage and arcing. It could be insulating heat sensitive or moisture sensitive components. Okay, so it's a it's a coating that does all of that. So uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, the defects you have. Just remember that coating failures in, in itself they lead to extra costs for the for the manufacturer or the 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 worst part of it all it could actually lead to project delays. Uh, Mostly what you'll find is that we're going to try to identify these uh, these types of common uh, defects and then try to give you a, a possibility of how to so, how to solve them. Um, conformal coating is applied in, in, a, in a number of different ways. You can obviously spray it. You can brush it. You can dip the, the coating as well, on, uh, dip the, the actual PC board into the coating itself and then pull it out and that'll apply it. 
the manufacturers have uh, in, industry specific guides that will help them. In particular, you have the IPC JST001. That's one of them for, again, that for electrical assemblies in itself. The second one in particular, um, you have the IPCA 6110G, which is mostly orientated to identify specific uh, defects in itself. Like, for example, uh, coating that isn't cured on a, on a board. That could give you a tremendous amount of issues. Uh, another one in particular would be like applying the coating itself to an area that isn't really needing to have uh, a coating on it or applying coating in areas that uh, are you know, kept specifically covered. Those are basic uh, defects, but again, they can lead to problems down the road. Right, and I think, let me uh, just uh, hit the, that first point, um, uh, the first two points, is there's all kinds of industry standards out there, but first and foremost, uh, the standards are set by the, the user or by the customer, by uh, whether that be the contract manufacturer or their customer. Um, they're going to set what is uh, required for a coating. So what's a defect for one might not be a de defect for another. There's not uni universal uh, rule for this, but there's certainly defects that are common. Uh, but give you an example, a defect of uh, an opening, a via uh, in the coating in a piece of bare board that has nothing around it, it may not cause any problems. Okay. So some customers that's fine. Some customers that's a serious defect. Okay. So, uh, or a process indicator uh, of, a, of a problem. So there's different uh, requirements for this, but it uh, largely is set by the customer himself? Uh, what we have here is uh, we have um, multiple causes and multiple effects that, are, that can be created in, in um, coding in itself. For example, um, you have to the, to the left of the screen, you will find some icons that are gonna relate to the specific application or whether the, the board has not been cleaned properly or whether it's a curing issue. Um, what you'll find in particular is that if, if for example, in, a, in the first uh, icon, it, it speaks towards cleaning the board prior to applying the coating. Well, that is very vital because as we have mentioned earlier, coatings will completely coat the surface of the, of the board and it will literally uh, and trap whatever whatever may be on that board if it's not properly clean. In an applicational sense, you can get, for example, thicker edges, or you can get uh, an, 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 an orange peel effect where the coating has ripples within it. Again, that's an applicational issue that can be looked at, and you can work your way backwards from there where you can adjust the, the proper uh, distance from the applicator to the actual board, minimizing those effects. Um, and finally, what the, the icon on, on the left, uh, the last one, it's pertaining mostly to curing and the curing issues that can occur by either an over, you know, over coating where you can create cracks within the actual coating itself. I already mentioned ripples, but again, rippling can also occur uh, by speeding up the actual curing aspect of it. Uh, delamination, which is something that, that happens when it pulls away from the surface of the board itself. And of course, voids and bubbles. So, so we're going to be breaking up some of these different defects specifically and talking about them point by point. And, uh, the, and one of the advantages of breaking it up by the different classifications is it helps you diagnose the problem, helps you narrow it down. And so you can do some A-B testing or some type of testing to see if you can eliminate the problem. For example, cleaning. If you suspect it's a cleaning problem, take the circuit board, clean the heck out of it, then coat it. If the problem goes away, then you can uh, tweak your process accordingly. So it's just a way to help diag uh, diagnose and uh, solve the problem. These little uh, icons, there's mix and match here. So these icons are used throughout and you'll see them. And the idea is, so as we're talking about it, you can kind of keep those classifications in mind. Let's take the first defect, de-wetting in itself. De-wetting is, is truly where the coating is, has not completely covered the, the surface of the board itself. 
there's where the substrate actual has uh, may have contaminants on them. Um, one that's very noticeable and most people tend to look at it is uh, fish eyeing. Fish eyeing is where the coating is actually has a contaminant underneath it where it could be something like a, a, an oil or a mold release or even adhesives. It could be just of uh, finger oils from handling the actual board uh, by the operator that may have not been wearing gloves. That can create a de-wetting aspect of it. Um, another another uh, area that can, can occur or another defect that can occur is uh, surface tension. Surface tension is actually where you find the, the surface may have had something on it that is causing the, the coating to be pushed away from the actual area that you're trying to apply it. This is a this is a, an issue that that can be remedied quite simply by washing the board properly, or maybe um, taking and backing away a little bit on the pressure that you're utilizing uh, to apply the coating onto it itself. Um, some some uh, fluxes also, or not some fluxes, but every flux can create some type of an interaction problem as well. Here the washing specifically of those boards and the removal of the fluxes will allow you to coat properly and give you a more even coating. Um, inner coat uh, issues between layers can give you issues as well, where again, where one layer isn't always cured properly, or maybe that layer did not go on that surface uh, smoothly, once the second layer is applied, that gap could create the, 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 the actual coating to back away from the surface or just lift away from the surface itself. These are very easily remedied with the cleaning of that board, or I should say the proper cleaning of that board. Yeah, and one thing just to mention too is, is the configuration of the de-wetting can really tell the story. I've, I've seen that time and time again. I've seen coatings back away from taped areas, for example, where it's uh, you know it, it points to adhesive that maybe uh, has a little bit of silicone in it. I've seen um, well, fish eyes uh, suggest particulates, you know, so it could uh, indicate maybe scoring, you know, something as you know some contamination from the scoring particulates from that. Um, you could see, um, you know, you know this, oh, around solder joints. If it's around solder joints, it could be an issue with the flux. So the position of the de-wetting of the defect can really tell the story. So that's when you, you call someone like us, the first thing we're going to ask for is photos. It, it really, really pays to take photos of what you've got, your defect. So when you bring it to us, bring it to John, bring it to Enrique, uh, it really tells the story. So let's, let's take a look at this particular slide. This particular slide is delamination. Here's where the coating is actually not adhering to the surface whatsoever. The coating itself has um, lifted from the surface. Uh, it, what it will happen is that the, the, the actual uh, material appears to be sticking to the surface. However, the surface itself and the coating has never really created a good bond. And that in itself can cause the, the coating to, to lift away. Another cause of delamination is uh, where you are applying a, an excessive amount of coating on the actual board itself. The excessive amount of coating can draw away from, from areas because of the fact of just the weight of the coating moving as, it, as it's starting to cure. Um, if, for example, the coating is not cured properly, there you can have lifting again because of the fact that the, the coating itself, had the initial coating, it did not cure and it did not adhere to the surface. What happens there is that as the, as the uh, board goes through the oven, it'll start to lift away. Um, most often, you will find this when, when you have a, a great deal of contamination, various contaminants can cause delamination to the board. Most often contaminants that are not washed off or contaminants that may have gotten onto the board while handling, all of these 
can create an issue where the, the actual uh, coating lifts away from the surface. As you can see on some of the slides, specifically the, the, the bottom uh, left slide, it shows a white blemishing area where the coating has lifted away. That's a great representation of delamination. And this one thing I want to point out is delamination, you can think of it as a cousin to uh, directly related to the previous slide, uh, de-wetting. And so the solution, the, the natural tendency when you have a de-wetting issue is to put it on thicker. OK, so let's let's say you've managed just by pure volume of coating to get it to lay across the surface. That doesn't mean it's still that doesn't mean it's sticking. And so uh, then that tends to lead to delamination. So uh, just keep think of those as cousins. And so it really could indicate um, the same problem. And so you could even have a delamination and de-wetting happening at different times, pulling your hair out. It's probably it could very well be the same problem. Okay, uniformity. Well, non-uniformity in particular. Here's here's an area where the the coating itself, and it depends on the type of of application that you're working with in particular. Uh, for example, non-uniformity is where the coating is thicker on one end and, and thinner on another. That could be just the actual. Uh, way that you're applying it. For example, let's say you're you're spraying it, and your 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 spray uh, gun is a little too close to one area, and as you move it across the actual board itself, you back away or you tend to go a little quicker than you should. Here, you would be applying uneven coating throughout the board because you're moving so quickly that you're not allowing the particulates of the coating. To adhere on an even on an even uh, process, there in itself you can have areas where, for example, the board has a high profile, a lot of high profile components. Again, the the uniformity can occur around the components themselves, as you can see in the in the center of that of that uh, slide. You have one that is showing a, a, an actual sag. Well, again. As you're applying your coating to the to the board itself, and you're applying it at such amount that it's it's actually puddling on the sides of the components themselves. There, you could have a, a, a tremendous problem. Um, sagging can also easily occur in dipping processes, where again the high-profile components can can entrap some of that coating and not allow it to flow properly over the surface itself. Uh, on the bottom uh, left side of the of the of the slide, you will see an area that that basically shows a component where the edges of that component has a a, a much thinner coating than the other edges. And again, that is where the the surface of the coating is has moved away because of the sharp point creates such a downward dra drag that it allows the coating to only allow a very thin layer to occur. These are things that could easily be remedied by one, slowing down. Don't, don't speed up so quickly as you're trying to coat your surface. Another way is if, for example, if you are brushing, uh, brush a little slower. Make sure that you, uh, you know, cover all the areas evenly. Um, in, in dipping, the process is as you're pulling uh, the 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 uh, the board out of the co out of the coating itself, slow down and pull it out slower to allow the coating to fill in all the gaps. All of that would be very very easily remedied by just taking a moment and slowing down your process so you can get an even coating going across the board completely. All right, thanks guys. I'll take this one now. Um, you know, when it comes to working with an automated coding system, you know, you've got a lot of uh, uh, uniformity in the robot. You know, you're going to move at a controlled speed, a controlled rate, uh, it's highly programmable, but obviously, you know, issues can happen. So, um, you know, like Enrique said, you want to, you want to make sure you have, um, you know, a consistent, even coverage, consistent, even speed, um, I've seen if you're, as he had mentioned, if you're too close to the substrate, you can kind of, you know, pull and, and push the coating. Um, you know, other issues can happen just from like the size of components, which can lead to shadowing where, 
uh, you know, the shape or the size of a large component can prevent the coating from reaching all the areas, which can lead to some thinner spots. Uh, maybe you're trying to coat that large component all around, and maybe you're getting some overspray from around uh, the spray pattern going past that component. Um, things like that can easily be fixed by just making an adjustment to your coating program and keep, you know, focusing where the coating goes onto the component only. Um, other things to look at, you know, look at the applicator that you're using, the spray head or the nozzle or the air cap. Make sure it's clean. Uh, utilize a solvent rest in your coating system so that when it's not in use, it keeps the nozzles clean and prevents any residue from getting built up on there. Uh, always pay attention to, you know, any maintenance and, and recommended rebuild by your um, equipment manufacturer as well. Um, uh, always pay attention to any dilution that you're using. If you're uh, using a solvent-based coating, for example, make sure you're using the proper dilution that fits what is recommended by your machine supplier. Um, along those lines, when you set up a system, make sure you've purged out any air in the system as well. Uh, you don't want any bubbles or air pockets to collect, which can lead to some spits and spatters and, and inconsistent volumes uh, being applied as well. Um, the, uh, the environment that the coating process is in, whether it's in a factory, a separate room, whatever, you want to make sure that's a, that's, you know, a fairly stable temperature and or humidity throughout the day. Um, uh, I've seen issues where you may have a uh, factory could be very cool in the morning. And then as the day goes on, the factory warms up and it gets warmer and warmer around the uh, coating system or around the, the reservoirs. And that can lead to you know, some changes in viscosity throughout the day, which can also lead to variations in output. Uh, I've also seen where you may have the reservoirs next to maybe a wave solder line or an oven or, or, or another piece of equipment that may have some, you know, be giving off some heat. Um, that can make an, have an effect on it there. So, um, you know, if you suspect there are, you do have a temperature issue, talk with your machine people. Uh, and, you know, many uh, suppliers uh, have options for whether it's, uh, you know, metering pumps, uh, temperature control, uh, fluid delivery, um, you know, uh, flow monitors, so on. There, you know, there's a number of different tools that can be added to coding systems to ensure you're applying the right volumes every time and help avoid a lot of these issues. Um, you know, along those lines, uh, you know, one thing we mentioned a bit earlier was about thickness. You know, maybe you've got just too much coating on the substrate. And that could lead again to the pooling, the buildup, dripping, so on. So, you know, too much is not always uh, a good thing. Um, and then, you know, the other thing uh, is, you know, what happens to the substrate after uh, it's coated? Uh, does it transfer from a conveyor through a inline curing oven? Or does an operator have to take it, transport it, you know, and walk it over to a rack or a ventilated oven or a ventilated station? Uh, so, you know, it's key to keep everything level and flat so that you don't risk uh, the, the liquid coating uh, falling or sliding or running to one side or the other. I got a quick question. Uh, I just uh, the dirty applicator kind of jumped out at me is the uh, the little solvent cup. Do you have a recommendation on how often you park the the head uh, the nozzle into the the cup to keep so, that clean, or is that just when in between runs? So a lot of it is related to you know what sort of material you're using, how fast it might skin over. Um, again, if it's solvent based, you know what's the sort of evaporation rate? How fast does it you know will it skin? Um, uh, with your typical solvent-based acrylics and silicones and urethanes, uh, typically if you're not running every 50 to 30 seconds, if there's a pause, then, uh, you know, the machines have timers that it'll automatically go over and rest in that cup. Then when another substrate comes in, it'll, it'll automatically purge and it'll be ready to go. Okay. Excellent. And one thing I did want to point out in terms of humidity, because I think intuitively every, everybody can imagine, okay, uh, you, know, high, you know, temperature swings, it's going to, you know, uh, flash off, the solvent's going to flash off faster. One thing, uh, you know, from, from our side is uh, why the humidity is so important is mo most of these coatings, these resins are humidity activated. So um, it starts the, uh, the, the coating cure process. And so if you're in a high humidity environment, or um, I've had complaints from Houston 
in the spring before the air systems are really kicking on uh, on a regular basis because higher humidity, so it's acting differently. Um, low humidity, it, it may have trouble curing, but it's not going to be an application problem. It'd be more on the cure side. So uh, just kind of give you a, a point in terms of that. Uh, here's an area where most often the defect is created either by a, a spray application where you're uh, you're spraying it so quickly and you're applying such a level of, of coating that you can entrap some of the solvent from it actually coming out of the coating itself. Uh, what, what, what can happen is something as simple as an adjustment of slowing the machine down or slowing your hands down will allow the coating to uh, allow the solvent that's trying to evaporate from getting out for getting out of the actual coating itself. The layer of coating can entrap some, some solvents which can create bubbles. Now these bubbles can occur in many, many different ways. In particular, if the solvent migrates underneath a component and as it, start, it starts to cure, that, that solvent comes back out, it could create a bubble as you can see on the, on the slide right in front of you. That bubble in itself, it creates a, a, a major defect where you actually have a bubble and no coating whatsoever underneath. That can cause uh, something to break. Uh, it would the bubble itself can burst in the oven, leaving you an empty gap. So that that's that's an area where you need to really uh, look at the 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 way that you're uh, reducing viscosity. Uh, if you are having to uh, take and and lower the viscosity of that particular coating to a level where you can apply it, you can over. Um, over uh, reduce it where you're applying so much solvent that the actual coating is uh, it, it becomes much thinner. Um, that can create bubbles. It can create voids uh, where again the coating isn't even there. Um, an area that that really has to be looked at thoroughly is the recommendation of the actual uh, coating manufacturer telling you where that that particular product, what viscosity that particular product should be applied at. That will make a big difference in how the, the actual coating adheres to the surface or whether it, it'll, uh, it'll go ahead and, and possibly you know, uh, get underneath a, a, a component. So make sure that you truly look at those uh, recommendations and try to adhere to them as much as possible. If the coating itself, for example, has um, some type of um, some type of a, 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 a humidity activated system, what can happen is if the humidity is way too high, you can get a blemishing effect where the coating itself will look kind of a whitish effect uh, on the surface of that coating. That's where the actual coating itself has already set up and you have entrapped solvent underneath it and it's trying to evaporate out. That can create, again, uh, bubbles, which is not something that you would want. Or uh, another area is if, as I mentioned earlier, is if it gets underneath a component. Now, most often when, when people are applying, using a spray gun, what happens there is that they tend to over, over dilute the product in itself, and that, causes it to be very runny. So they're overcompensating for it by adding multiple passes in, and then and again, and trapping some of the solvents that are within layers. That can cause you some major problems. And then finally, if you're, if you're doing a different application, for example, if you're brushing, if, if anybody has ever painted a wall and have moved very quickly across that wall with your paintbrush, you can see bubbles are automatically uh, forming on that surface. This can happen as well in, an, in a spray application where you are moving over that surface so quickly that it's, it's, it's literally applying uh, the coatings very, very fast. The bubbles themselves can be created by maybe you're applying too much air in that system and it's creating, creating that, that, uh, that defect. So, be aware of those and be aware of the fact that, again, 
looking at the at the the recommendation that the manufacturer has given you for that coating is vital. Yeah, good stuff. So you know, even even in a robotic application, same thing. Uh, bubbles can can occur. Again, thickness we touched on that quite a bit, and you're going to see that mentioned probably quite a few times throughout here. Um, thickness is key, so you know, pay attention to that. Um, uh, you know, spraying pressure. Uh, you know, Enrique touched on that a bit. You know, if you have a, if you're using say an atomized sprayer and you're using a lot of atomizing air or too high fluid pressure, you're creating a lot of turbulence. Same thing. You're kind of turning the coating over on itself and and potentially trapping some some air pockets inside there. Um, uh, some other things. You know, look at at, at uh, how dry the air is coming into your uh, reservoir. So you know what this can lead to is you know you, if you have moisture in your lines. Then um, they be they they fall into your or the moisture gets trapped inside the reservoir and kind of gets impregnated into the coating itself, uh, which then you may not see until later on after you apply the coating and wait for a few minutes and you'll see that uh, you know these bubbles start forming out of nowhere and uh, so that's that's a, a pretty strong culprit there as well. Um, dilution as well, you know, again, pay attention to the proper dilution that's called out for your applicator. Um, something not to be confused with the, the moisture issue is having uh, air or gas absorbed into the coating. Uh, this can happen whether you're using dry air or a nitrogen supply. Uh, really, if you're, if you're over pressurizing a reservoir, you know, too high, too much pressure for too long. And uh, the coating can kind of absorb the gas over time. So it's always recommended to, uh, you know, bleed the pressure from your supply tanks, you know, if the system's down for extended periods of time, if it's overnight, over weekend, shut down, whatever. Uh, and then it's always recommended to use a clean, dry uh, supply air, whether you need to add an inline air dryer or uh, a nitrogen supply. And then finally, you know, again, pay attention to if there's any uh, air in the fluid system, make sure it's purged out and you have a good, clean, uh, consistent flow of fluid to your applicators. Some of these images here um, pertain to what you might see after a curing step. And, um, you know, a lot of times really pay attention to your cure profile. Are you going too hot, too fast? Um, if you see the image on the right where you see kind of bubbles everywhere on components and everything else uh, and, and even under components, uh, then it might simply be it's just too hot too soon. So, you know, use a more gradual uh, uh, ramp to temperature. Um, if you see bubbles everywhere and even if you're not going through a forced cure step, then you've most likely got absorbed air in the coating. So you want to, you know, degas your reservoir and, and just, you know, vent the vent the pressure and let the let the coating relax for a bit. Um, you know, thickness can have an issue too. You know, a lot of coating, too much coating around a lot of leaded components uh, can lead to that as well. And then in some cases I've seen, uh, not very often, but I've actually seen it happen, you know, some upstream residues will react uh, or can react underneath some components and lead to, you know, some bubbles because it, it creates a weird reaction uh, during the cure process. And um, going back a little bit to um, not so much the moisture issue, but again, the absorbed air issue, I wanted to point this out. This is a good example of what happens if you have a lot of absorbed air or gas inside a reservoir. Um, this was a coating that's been uh, under pressure for, you know, too long. Uh, you know, most times you only need about anywhere from 10 to 20, 10 to 30 PSI. And, and, you know, some people, you know, like I say, more is not always better. They might want to run it up to like 50 PSI, 60 PSI. It's not really recommended in most cases. And especially if you're not bleeding off pressure to the tanks, you can get something like this. So uh, what's recommended is, uh, you know, bleed pressure to the tank, uh, even remove the lid for, for a, a minute if you have to, or just remove it off to the side. Uh, and what you see is this, it looks like beer foam. And essentially it's the gas just coming out of the coating because it's, it's you know, relaxing and breathing. So, so again- That's actually like a carbonation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's almost it's like a carbonation so process. It forces the gas into the, into the liquid as almost a carbonation. Yep, yep. Except you don't want that in this case. Beer, <laughs> yes. Coating, no. Uh, so again, you know, clean, dry air. Don't overpressurize it for too long. 
All right, cracking. So um, again, pay attention to your thickness. Uh, too much and during you know cure cycle, if you have, uh, I've seen some with you know like very aggressive solvents, very fast evaporating solvents, uh, MEK type products, tylene type products that with very high uh, percentage load or very high percentage uh, thin, uh, and they and they cure too fast, then I've seen cracks if it's applied way too thick. So again, pay attention to that. Um, I've also seen cracking happen um, almost in conjunction with uh, a delamination uh, due to a demasking operation. So if you're using a tape mask or using a liquid mask or something like that, um, pay attention to how you, you demask the substrate. Uh, you know, use a more gentle uh, removal of the mask. Maybe don't let the coating cure completely so it's completely tack free. You know, maybe so it's uh, still a little bit tacky so that you can can pull the uh, the mask off without um, you know causing any any stress on the coating itself and leading to a crack and and uh, delamination. And um, same thing, you know, it could it could also have something to do with the adhesion as well. Um, you know, again, kind of go hand in hand with uh, the adhesion uh, and delamination. All right, so orange peel. Orange peel is, uh, think of a, a lake on a windy day, and it kind of stays like that all over your board. Um, I'm going to say it again, you know, pay attention to your film thickness. Uh, if, you're, if you're putting too much wet coating down, maybe the applicator is too close to the substrate, and you're creating this turbulence, um, you know, that can have an effect as well. Um, I've seen in some cases where people prefer to coat their substrate at, when it's warm, to help maybe flash off or cross-link the coating a little bit quicker. Pay attention to what that temperature is. If it's too hot, I've seen it, it create some weird stresses on the, the, the polymers inside there, which can uh, lead to some wrinkling. Um, so, you know, obviously don't, don't coat a board that's, you know, way too hot out of an oven, for example. Uh, you know, give it a time to get a little bit closer to room temperature uh, before you, you coat it. Um, if people are doing a multi-layer coating, maybe they need a, an excessive thickness or they're trying to just do a, a multi-layer type pass to get coverage on all angles of a component where you're doing uh, you know, multiple wet layers, it's always good to let the prior layer of coating cure a little bit. Well, not completely cure, you're just kind of letting it kind of stabilize and become a little bit tacky still. Um, and then uh, apply the other coating over it to let the two layers kind of meld together. Um, if you're doing a spraying process, so if you're using like an atomized sprayer, uh, check to make sure you're using the right uh, atomizing pressure. Uh, make sure you're not, you know, either spraying it too high or too low. Uh, too high pressure, you kind of create this excess turbulence and it, it kind of, again, rolls over itself and creates those waves. Uh, too low pressure and maybe doesn't have enough force behind it to let it uh, force it to wet out nicely. So, you know, again, talk with your machine manufacturer, understand what settings you need to apply your coating. Um, uh, in some cases, if you've got a lot of topography, you've got to spray at some angles. Uh, I always say try not to spray usually beyond like, you know, say 45 degrees, for example. If you're doing a real extreme angle uh, of the, the spray head to the board, try not to overdo it because again, you're kind of forcing the coating to roll over itself as it's moving you know, across the, the board surface. Um, pay attention to your cure profile again. And uh, other things I've seen is, is you know, air circulation, whether it's in the oven or if you've got a ventilated chamber or a ventilated queue, uh, pay attention to where that uh, that venting source is, uh, how and how close and how much air is traveling over the substrate in that area. If you're pulling a lot of air over the substrate as it's curing, then um, you know uh, you may have to add a, ba a baffle or, or something to to prevent that from happening and, and you know direct the airflow away from there. To help prevent a lot of these things from happening, you know you know stay in touch with your equipment supplier, uh, reach out. Uh, even if you don't have an issue, maybe you're just asking about how to run a new coating. Maybe you're curious to know if you're using the right settings, maybe the right cure profiles, and, you know, talk with your uh, uh, material supplier as well. You know, you want to make sure you understand the, the proper settings for the equipment. Uh, we generate a lot of profiles on for all of our applicators. 
so we can give you a lot of starting uh, settings to use for most any coding that's out there. Um, you know, again, maintain a, a stable environment, you know, temperature control, humidity control. If not, talk with your machine supplier to understand what tools uh, are offered to maintain proper flow rates, uh, proper temperature control, flow monitoring, so on. Um, we always recommend keeping your fluid levels at 50% 50, 50 or greater in your pressure pots. Uh, that's just to eliminate the risk of uh, maybe drawing an air pocket into a dip tube, for example. Uh, you know, always pay attention to obviously the pot life and shelf life of the coating to ensure you're using fresh um, uh, products every time. And then, you know, simply just maintain good housekeeping practices, uh, keep the applicators clean, make sure you perform normal uh, preventive maintenance on the machines itself, uh, uh, rebuild kits, so on. Uh, you know, keep the areas clean, dust free, uh, keep the nozzles clean, so on. And then along that line, you know, when it comes to the nozzles, uh, again, this will happen when you talk with your equipment supplier about, you know, what applicator do I need for the job? Uh, do I need a, a fine or medium pattern uh, atomized sprayer, or do I need to use an airless applicator? So I've got a lot of low profile substrates. So, you know, with atomizing heads, they're very good for, for substrates that have a lot of dense components, a lot of tall and small components. Maybe it's mixed technology, large components you need to get around. Uh, maybe you've got to coat a lot of three-dimensional surfaces. That's where atomizing really, really works well. Uh, atomizing will help you achieve the lowest film thickness you need uh, of, of any coating that's out there. Uh, it's also the most versatile type of technology for applying liquid coatings. It can you know, apply very low viscosity to very high viscosity normal coatings. Um, if you're using a solvent-based product, uh, typically you'd adjust your dilution uh, just to provide a clean spray pattern from the atomized head. If you're using an airless applicator and you're doing a lot of low profile surface mount type uh, technology boards, uh, where it puts out a, a, just a, a liquid stripe of coating, uh, then you've got to pay attention to, you know, close attention to viscosity of the coating. Uh, typically 65, 75 centipoise is kind of the sweet spot for those types of applicators. Uh, these use a, a much higher applicator speed because it puts out such a large volume of coating. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, pay attention to, uh, if you see any sort of splashing or anything like that, uh, that can actually happen from some of the higher applicator speeds, uh, whether it is an atomized or an airless. So, um, you know, work with your, your machine supplier and they will help guide you down the right path to choose the right applicator. And, you know, when we're talking about conformal coding, you know, we always try to approach this as a selective process. You know, we're trying to do this without masking, minimal handling. And sometimes it's not always achievable without adding some other step or feature. So, you know, a lot of times um, you might have issues with wicking into connectors or open vias. So in that case, you know, take a look and see if your coating supplier or if you have another product that you're familiar with, that's got a higher viscosity that's compatible with the process, use that as a gel or dam around these sensitive areas. Uh, liquid masking can be applied as well. Uh, if you're trying to, to maybe protect a test point or, or a ground plane or some area that can't be selectively coated somehow. Uh, and then these, these are all uh, easily dispensed with uh, needle dispense valves, typically within the same machine. Uh, or, you know, if depending on throughput, can be broken out into a separate process in the line. As John had mentioned, housekeeping is vital. If, if you have dirty equipment, you will you will encounter many defects in itself. The best thing to do is keep your tools and your containers as clean as possible. Uh, for for worker safety, make sure that you're in a well ventilated area to to make sure you're not inhaling all the the fumes that the the application can occur. Um, make sure that when you're uh, uh, adding to your reservoir, you're not pouring it in with such high turbulence. In the, in the process that you're building and you're you're literally sucking air in into the actual coating itself. This again, as we spoke with before, uh, can create bubbles. They it can create failures in in the uh, the coating adhering to a surface. 
So make sure that that in the process you're pouring slowly. Um, obviously, viscosity is vital when you're when you're applying coating. So make sure that the viscosity uh, is at the right setting that is re recommended by your supplier. Make sure that you use a viscosity cup to check those viscosity points to make sure that they are uh, properly uh, in their properly proper range. Um, give some time to the bubbles that are may have been incorporated in the reservoir and allow them to bubble out prior to closing that. Um, what, what I will definitely tell you is do not pull a vacuum trying to pull those bubbles out because in the process, you may pull some of the solvents that are within the coating itself and create, again, additional issues further down the road. So make sure that you don't do it in that manner. These are just minor, but again, it's something that you should do. So um, you probably remember uh, earlier, and uh, we've quite talked about and mentioned excessive thickness, you know, quite extensively. So um, here's a simple check you can do uh, typically, in, you know, in the beginning of production, maybe if you want to do a simple characterization of, of the system or a new material or the applicator, um, you know, uh, what this uh, simply involves is, you know, take a, take a bare circuit board, Take a, a metal plate that's clean and flat. Uh, you can even use glass. Uh, we've used even coated, uh, you know, cardstock. And um, simply, you're applying a, a sprayed area onto that substrate using the parameters you are either currently using with your um, production process, uh, or run your production program on that that you know flat uh, substrate. And once you do that, then you can uh, choose to do a thickness measurement of the coating, whether it's wet or dry. Uh, if you choose to do it wet, uh, you can use a, you know, a low cost wet thickness gauge. It's essentially a, a calibrated comb that uh, you dip into the wet coating. And when you remove it, you can see which of the teeth uh, have coating on them, which can uh, then tell you you have you know, so much coating and not, you know, an, an example here, it shows you have three thousandths of coating, but not quite four thousand. So if that's in range, you're good to go. Uh, if you choose to check uh, your thickness when it's dry, then you can use something like a, you know an eddy current meter or ultrasonic gauges. But you also want to make sure the coating is very well uh, dried and cured so that you don't have any tacky or soft spots. You get an accurate measurement. Um, if you find that uh, something's a little bit out of whack, you make an adjustment. Whether it's adjusting adjust your flow rate. Uh, uh, stroke setting, um, you know, robot speed, whatever, uh, and then, you know, run the check again, and then, uh, you know, you should be good to go. Again, reach out to your equipment suppliers, and, you know, they'll help you walk through all this. Yeah, it, while we're talking about uh, thickness, uh, one thing I want to point out is, you know, when, there, when a customer might be uh, initially qualifying the thickness they're after. The, it's common to start with the dry thickness you're after, use a calculation with the solids of the coating you're using and apply that wet coating. The problem is, is uh, that wet coating may not, it may not be able to get there. You may not be able to apply it that thick. It may take two or three passes. So if, uh, you know, you're in its speed, you know, everything's speed and efficiency, I want to push it through with one pass. There's trade-offs with that. And a lot of the defects we've talked about uh, can be caused by trying to lay too much all at one time, too fast, cranking up the heat. So you're curing that big thick coating, you know, all of these things that can be caused by a compensation of maybe the coating isn't the right solids content. You need to talk to your coating manufacturer for a higher viscosity model, you know? So there's different conversations that can be had to really make the rest of your process easier and to avoid some of these defects we're talking about. All right. Last but not least, um, you know, in an automated process, you know, one of the last things you're going to go through is the curing step. So um, if you're using a, a, a force cure method, you know, whether you use a, a you know, heated heating oven, uh, UV, whatever, you know, typically, you know, today we're mostly talking about a lot of, a lot of solvent based or heat cure type products. Um, you know, our preferred method is, is to use an IR infrared oven. Uh, essentially you're, you're warming the substrate uh, from the inside out um, versus a convection oven where you're warming the air around it. Um, now 
to be clear, convection ovens work perfectly well, but you've got to be careful um, on how fast you ramp the temperature, how much airflow is in there. You know, again, um, I mentioned, you know, like the rippling effect. Uh, some convection ovens have a lot of airflow running through there. So, you know, pay attention to where some of those, those the airflow jets are directed. Um, you know, uh, again, pay attention to your profiles. If you see on the right side, I've got two examples of different profiles. Uh, Solvent-based acrylic has a very slow uh, and gradual ramp up to its its max curing temp. Typically, you know, on average, somewhere around 65, 70 C. Uh, in other cases, if you've got, say, 100% um, solids, uh, heat cure silicone, for example, then you could have a much faster ramp to temp. Uh, which is typically higher. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that may work for your substrate. If you start seeing bubbles and other things happening, then you may have to, you know, slow down that that ramp to temperature anyway. Uh, so pay attention to, to you know, um, what your max temps are. And then, you know, also pay attention to what are the max temps that your components can handle. Uh, you don't want a, a pile of mush coming out the other side of your oven. So, you know, it's always good to periodically run a check with your system as well to make sure that, uh, you know, your boards are, are reaching temp. You know, it's good to use uh, a production level board if that's not available, if you have a scrap board, um, you know, something something that's a close representative to your production product so that you know exactly what you're dealing with and uh, understand thermal mass and um, uh, understand what temperature profiles will work for your process. Again, this is a cleaning issue. Uh, if, if, if again, you're looking at, you're, you're getting a defect such as fisheye, make sure that the, the, the coating is, uh, or I should say that the uh, board is actually clean. If you're, if you're experiencing things like de-wetting, again, that's another issue where, that's another defect that can create uh, uh, an, an area where the, the actual coating is not wetting out the surface. Uh, the number one thing here uh, to, to prevent this would be cleaning the board properly. Um, fluxes can absorb a lot of moisture and then in the oven itself, they can cause the moisture to be admitted back in, in and around the coating itself, causing some of that to be lifting. It could down the road create corrosion. Um, every PC board, whether it's a no clean board or a, a regular R, RMA board, all of them should be clean to prevent any of the contaminants that may be on that, uh, on that board to be removed prior to applying a coating. As, as, as you know, conformal coating covers the surface. So if the surface has an imperfection on it, that will be covered by the coating. And again, you could lose adhesion, you could create bubbles, you could create de-wetting, all of those things can occur. So uh, uh, easiest way to avoid all of that would be to wash the board uh, properly with the proper chemicals to, to remove all those excess residues that are on there. Uh, releasing agents are another uh, form of uh, contaminant that can be on a board easily uh, uh, by just handling. Uh, the, the fact that, uh, that a um, an operator isn't washing, or uh, I should say, isn't wearing gloves, that could create transfer some of those uh, defects uh, and some of the soils back onto that board. So be aware of that. Um, the the worst one in particular would be your your silicone contamination, which can create fish eyes across the board. Thank yeah, one one thing, one way to look at it is um, if you're not cleaning, it's not all about flux. If you're not cleaning your board, everything that happened to that board before uh, the coating process can be a source of contamination. So if you're not cleaning the board, you're putting a lot of trust in your bare board manufacturer, all the handling, uh, how it's stored, how the boards are stored uh, mid process. Uh, your component manufacturers, because there could be, uh, you know, different release compounds and such on, on the components themselves. You know, you're counting on all that being right, and it can be a big chemistry experiment uh, if there's a lot of contamination on that board. So something to keep in mind. Now, the, the issue of no clean fluxes, okay, I'm not going to get into that in, uh, in detail, but there is a nice article on the TechBird website uh, on that specific issue. There's been some new studies on that. 
uh, for reported on that. And so I'll I'll be uh, along with um, the recording of this. Um, we'll uh, you know you'll get a link to that as well. Now we do have a few questions. Uh, Sorry, I was a little a little late because I didn't notice that there was a chat and a QA. I do that every time. Uh, we've got one that's uh, what about surface tension for adhesion? And that's really what we're talking about with cleaning is it's it's very much uh, usually a contamination issue. There's something between the circuit board and that coating that's not working. And that's uh, increasing the uh or lowering the surface tension. And so you get that water on a wax car kind of effect. And so that can lead to adhesion problems or de-wetting problems, okay, delamination. Uh, this next one, um, John, I'll, I'll leave this to you um, because I'll go ahead and let's knock off some of these questions. Uh, is it recommended to use the gauge or measure thickness equipment when the application is using a needle valve and is over one millimeter? So, um, you know, if you're trying to do a, a very thick application, uh, there are gauges that go much higher, uh, although I don't know where they will cap out. Uh, at that point, you, if you've got a, you know, a one millimeter thick layer of something, you know, whether it's encapsulant or something else, then, um, then you, uh, you know, you can almost use a digital caliper at that point, you know, let the, let the product cure and then, you know, measure it using something like that. Um, but there are a, a, a wide range of gauges that you can use to measure wet as well. Um, so, you know, check with the supplier and see if they have something uh, they would recommend for that. Excellent. I'm going to change the slide, but I got one more question. Um, you know, is vacuum acceptable to reduce bubbles that are present after spray coating? Uh, erythane uh, 5750 thinned with toluene to hand spray uh, immediately after spray or when toluene has flashed off. So um, do you have any experience with that, John? I, I would typically say no. Um, maybe use, um, try and use a slightly slower evaporating solvent. I'm, I can't remember if you can use xylene with that particular product, which has got a slower evaporating rate than the toluene does. That may be a little more favorable for what you're trying to do. Um, the timing might be a little too aggressive in how fast it flashes off, which could be something to do with it. Uh, again, you know, pay attention to, you know, what, what's the environment that you're doing this in? Is it, is it hot? Is it cool? Is it hum humid? So on. Um, so look at all those things. Uh, but I typically maybe try either a hair more toluene or switch to something that's a little bit slower evaporating as you're thinner. Okay. Thanks, John. Well, that gets through us through the questions. Of course, feel free to type in more or even better, reach out to us. Okay, you've got our contact information. You don't have to solve these defects by yourself. Okay, you've got your equipment manufacturers, you've got your coding manufacturers. Okay, so we're here to help you guys. And so, um, you know, so coding defects, a lot of times lack of cleaning. Uh, an application and coding issues. And that can really, those kind of uh, segments help us uh, diagnose what's going on. Uh, the, the, the location of the defect and tell a story. And remember, photos really help us out. So if you've got a problem you need us to help you with, please take some photos, get them out to us along with your email, and that would help a lot. Uh, cleaning reduces a lot of problems. I mean, if you want to open up your process window, uh, dialing in your your thickness of the coating you're applying to a reasonable level and uh, cleaning is going to really open up your process window and reduce your defects. Uh, other things can go wrong and you still got a wonderful coating if you can just kind of get some of that under control. Uh, so again, work with a coating formulator and, and your equipment uh, manufacturer. Um, one thing, a little plug here that uh, at TechSpray, at ITW, we do have a full service qualification and in, in develop, product development lab. And so, you know, on the coding side, we certainly can uh, help you through these issues. Or if you're setting up a new coding uh, line uh, or trying to spec in a new material, we can help with that process. You see right in the middle of that shot, uh, John, you recognize that piece of equipment? I do is a PVA. So we can actually code in house and, you know, for the qualification process. So we do have, you know, hands-on uh, experience, uh, experience with this. Reach out to us if you do have any questions. 
There's our contact information. And thank you. It was already ran five minutes long. It's pretty good for us. We did have that interruption by the government, uh, but if you saw that message, it said buy text break coding. And uh, it wasn't cheap, but we, we had that slipped in there. Um, so appreciate you all attending today and yeah, have a good day.